everybody. My name is Quest Sandow. I'm a member of Ascend Leadership, and this is the Ascend YouTube channel. Today, I'm joined by one of Ascend's newest staffers. He's a senior at John F. Kennedy High School, Joseph Mossieri. Welcome, Joseph. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, thank you. So, before we go any further, I just want to ask you a couple of just get to know you questions, very basic, okay? Yeah. Where are you located, like in the country? Where is Kennedy? Uh, Sacramento, California, the part of California not Los Angeles so no one really hears about it like we kind of have the capital but that's just so people have a reason to know Sacramento exists gotcha gotcha okay so how did you get in debate in the first place is Kennedy like a big debate school uh so it's not a I wouldn't say it's a big debate school like there's obviously schools where their teams are like 80 to 100 people I'd say we're roughly 20 on a good year but the way I got into it was, this was like the third day of school. I was sitting in my history class. And then the coach of Kennedy, who at the time was like an 18-year-old kid fresh out of high school, comes into the classroom and gives this spiel about why speech and debate is like the best thing ever. And I was not paying attention until the part where he said, do you like arguing with your parents? And honestly, if it were not for that line, I probably would not be doing debate because I would not have thought there was anything appealing about it at all. But here I am, four years later, and I am better at arguing with my parents. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so then at what point did you start doing debate camps? Like which summer? Um, so the summer in junior year, senior year, just the most recent one was the first time I actually went to a camp because I, had, I didn't really take debate super duper seriously until around like the beginning of junior year. Up until then, I kind of only did like local tournaments, which aren't the most competitive compared to like national tournaments, the tournament of champions. I would kind of only do locals, didn't take it too seriously, just had fun collecting like the little plastic trophies here and there. Okay, and then what changed junior year? Um, honestly, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just because our team planned on doing more national invitationals. Like we had scheduled Glenn Brooks and Harvard on our yearly schedule. So I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to have any ounce of success at any big tournament or meet any of the goals that some of my other teammates had done if I don't start taking this seriously on a national scale and try and become one of the more prominent debaters that can hold their own no matter what round they're in. Okay. And then that led you to join Ascend after that junior year had ended. And you had quite a successful junior year, right? Uh, it got pretty successful near the end. I did preside the national final round for the House of Representatives. And from there, I kind of wanted to prove that I wasn't just going to have to be someone who presides in order to get good results, in order to like make these big final rounds. Okay. Had it not been for Ascend, I don't think I would have been able to become someone who didn't have to rely on presiding. Because I've ended up making um, national level final rounds at Glen Brooks and Yale, almost like debating the entire way. I haven't been having to preside. I mean, I still do sometimes because chambers sometimes don't have them. But I don't need to preside if... I think that's my only chance of moving on. I'm confident in my skills as a debater if I want to have success. Oh, awesome. And then what is, like, at Ascend that summer, what do you think you learned the most about? Can you tell us just more about the Ascend experience? Yeah. So one of my favorite things about Ascend is their uh, mocks. There's, like, four of them a week. I think this is really special because if it's a normal summer, you're not really having any tournaments. Like, school's not happening. Tournaments aren't happening. Mm -hmm. every week there would be four different individual rounds where you could prep a bill go debate it and then people are ranked and you're given feedback at the end I mean that's probably even more beneficial than tournaments during the regular year because if you're doing an actual tournament there's anywhere from like three to seven rounds maybe even ten if you're going to like Harvard or Nationals and you don't get feedback until you're completely done with the tournament and you have judge comments for Ascend you could do one bill so like at the longest an hour and a half of debate and you would immediately have feedback from people who are very qualified as judges. Like, I know a lot of times in debate, there's this difference between a flow judge and a lay judge. And more often than not, these lay judges are parents who are judging because their child has signed up for the tournament. But when you have as judging you, whether or not they choose to evaluate on a more lay standpoint or a flow standpoint or somewhere in between, you're given immediate feedback and feedback that's a lot more relevant and a lot more broad to how you want to be as a debater. And it's just going to be a lot more competitively viable with, compared to if you're going 10 rounds with a single problem that's persisting each time. Okay. 
Awesome. So, you know, sounds like you've had quite a, quite a journey in the debate world, you know, not taking it super seriously, joining because, you know, you wanted to argue with your parents more, other than taking it seriously, getting third at nationals as a presiding officer, then going out and having success as a debater. Uh, I imagine you have lots of advice for students out there. What would you say the single biggest piece of advice is for any student? So for any student, you can always look at these um, competitors that are really accomplished. Like any of the other Ascend staffers, everyone who's being hired is accomplished. And you can look at them and see what they do well, what they do less well, and you can take these and try and add them to your own skill set. However, there is no way that you can have the success you want if you're just trying to become a carbon copy of a single debater. Like, it's okay to take an aspect from one person and a different aspect from someone else, but there has to be a point where you introduce your own personality and your own like form of debating into this mix that it truly becomes good enough to succeed. Mm -hmm. You can copy people and have mild success here and there. Like you might make one final round and then dwindle around prelim dropping, sems drop, who knows. But when you can introduce your own uniqueness as a debater, that's when you really start to stand out. And that's when your results become more consistent and you can become more happy results. Well, and that kind of bleeds into my next question, which is about um, for you as a competitor and your growth over your four years, what do you think was most important for you to grow? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that I can even pinpoint like the exact time in my career when this happened. Uh, tournament of Champions 2020, not a good tournament for me. I got like third to last in my prelim chamber. Wasn't even close to breaking at all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the comments I had were pretty consistent that I was just not an engaging debater. Like even if everything I was saying was true, people didn't want to listen to it because I didn't give them any stylistic reason to. So no matter what I was saying, they weren't listening. It did not matter if I had the best argument in the round because to them, they stopped paying attention after about 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. From this gap between Tournament of Champions to National Championship, my speaking, we finally found a speaking style that worked for me, me and my coach, that is. My speaking style suddenly became completely different from what my coach was used to coaching. Like if you've seen Rohit Jawar, which I'm assuming if you're on the Ascend YouTube channel, you definitely have heard of Rohit Jawar, maybe you even idolize him. But Rohit's speaking style is very distinct. He's very loud, commanding, authoritative in round. If you've ever seen me in round or just as a person, I don't have that type of speaking. I had tried to learn that type of speaking because of Rohit's success didn't work for me. I just don't have the voice for it, I guess. But when I adopted a more calm speaking style, one that was more unique to myself, my results immediately became better from getting third to last in a TO chamber to getting third at nationals, albeit POing, but you can't make it to national finals without debating at least half of the time. The second that I finally realized that I needed to add some sort of my own personality into my debating was literally the exact time I started being successful. Okay. That is cool. That is cool. Which also carries over into my next question. You know, you talked about having Rohit Jawar as a teammate. Was he a debater you looked up to or was there other debaters you looked up to along the way? Yeah, of course. He's the national champion, TOC champion. It's hard not to look up to someone who is that successful and also on your team and also taller than you. It's impossible to not look up at him. But as someone who is his teammate, because I'm seeing him learn as well and I also have the same coach, it's pretty easy for me to see the things he does and try and take them into my own style. And that's fine. If I want to learn about how he handles flow concepts, how he handles arguments, I can do just that. But at the point where I try and become a carbon copy is where you start to not do as good because all of these big name debaters also have their unique style and you can't take that from them because it's theirs. So as much as I looked up to Rohit, I can only take so much from any other debater. That's good. So that actually, you know, you talk about your coach at the same coach as Rohit. That guy must be pretty cool, right? Like having an absolute legend like that. Yes, sir. That's, you know, so having you, so your coach, great guy, like overall winner, you know, maybe borderline perfect Hall of Fame of debate coaching. Do we agree on that? I mean, that's a subjective, <laughs> that's a subjective take. Mm. You, you can think that you're entitled to that. I'll, I'll respect it. Okay. Well, yeah, just for the record, it sounds like your coach is like, I don't know. I mean, you said something about having a true legend as your coach. If you sign up for a send, you can get Rohit Jawar. Okay. <laughs> and like, you know, and 19 other true legends, to be fair. 
Um, okay, which speaking of coaching, you you know, you will be coaching soon. What are you looking forward to most about it? Uh, I think one of my favorite things as a debater has been being able to incorporate a pretty lay friendly take on everything that happens. I know that a bunch of people really like doing this very fancy flow style of Congress where it's pretty similar to like TF or LB where they use these, these fancy words like way on magnitude on shareholders and um, non-unique, stuff like this. These are all cool terms and all, like Tournament of Champions loves these. But if you're just having a parent judge, they have no idea what this means because it's not like they can turn on the news and see Bernie Sanders telling you that's non-unique to the legislation that's in front of them. To parent judges, you have to have something accessible. So you can still do all of these flow concepts while doing it in a way that everyone, no matter their background, understands what you're saying. I think this is something that's like really overlooked in debate because people tend to look at lay versus flow as if you have to become one or the other and to the most extremes. They see lay debaters as people who do calm speaking, tend to speak early, and that's about that. They see flow debaters as sort of authoritative figures who are always refuting you and always coming up with the most powerful argument in the round. I really don't think you have to choose one of the two and the people who do the best in speech and debate often find a mix of them. Like Rohit Jawar would often not use terms such as non-unique, way on flow. Like he would use them in some rounds, but the rounds that he did the best in, you wouldn't find these in his vocabulary. If he wanted to weigh on magnitude, he would say something like, consider which side affects the most people. I think finding that balance between lay and flow is the way that you can find the most success. And it's not even a huge change most of the times. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, with all that being said, it would be kind of cool to see Majority Leader Schumer go up there and tell McConnell that he's weighing on magnitude. <laughs> if one of them did, I mean, maybe I would have a chance at being a real Congress member, telling people that my sticky defense can't be gotten through. <laughs> and that, would, that would provide a whole new element to uh, the congressional debate in the real Congress. <laughs> um, okay, so some more fun questions. What is the funniest story from your debate career? I mean, this could be taken as funny or it could be taken as disturbing, but Harvard 2020. Great start. So I'm from California, as I said, where in the summers, it's like a cool 90 to 100 and in winters, it's 30 to 50. So it's pretty, it fluctuates pretty, pretty regularly. But Harvard in uh, Massachusetts is a lot colder. So we arrive there, I'm used to this semi-warm weather most of the time. Harvard, it's like 30 degrees and it even snowed on one of the days we were there. Um, apparently I'm not really built for the cold because about an hour and a half into the first round, I got like the worst bloody nose of my life. I ruined the suit I had there and I ended up meeting a bunch of debaters in the bathroom, like some that are even at a send now. So that's a weird story to tell people, but that probably was the funniest moment, except for the part where it did make me sick because it's a bloody nose, but nice, nice. Wow. Their own. You know, it happens. California kids. That's why we, that's why most oh, of Oh, it, it happens all the time, I bet. It, I'm sure it does. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. You know, could have gone yeah. to Berkeley. <laughs> yep, could have. Mm -hmm. Maybe should have. Uh, but with that out the way, uh, of the entire, entire Ascend staff, which by the time this recording is going to be put out there, the entire staff will be released on the website. Um, so of that yep. staff, who are you most looking forward to working with? Honestly, I, I'm really excited to work with everyone hired because everyone is super accomplished. We are all true legends, as you said earlier. Um, I mean, I guess a better question would be who I don't want to work with. Uh, the hired John Luca Medigovic, he's from Florida. He's kind of, kind of a, he's a, he's a real character. What is, this is a, a question that we have gotten for every interview so far from people just submitting. What is your favorite piece of legislation? Favorite to debate or just favorite that I've seen? Uh, both. So favorite that I've seen, uh, obviously this one wasn't debated because it's only the favorite I've seen, but I, I saw a bill where it was, I think it was a resolution where they wanted to replace the bald eagle with the turkey to be the state bird. I guess it had something to do with like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Roosevelt, someone who wanted to actually make it the turkey. And the whole resolution was worded as in America is, has not lived up to the virtue of a bald eagle and instead we are better represented by a turkey i thought that was just the funniest thing i've ever seen and i i kind of wish it was debated just to see people saying yes 
this Congress should be spending its time passing a bill to put the turkey as the national bird instead of the bald eagle. I mean, the impacts would be real, real strong there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no more Thanksgiving, I guess. But the best I've ever, de favorite I've ever debated would probably be felons voting legislation. Uh, we have voted or debated it quite often, but like the Long Beach Invitational, which was like the only invite I've ever won, that was one of the final bills. So I kind of have to hold it in a special place in my heart because it just means quite a bit to me, considering it was the first bill I did good enough on to actually win a tournament. And winning any invite had been one of my goals since I started. And that was just a really great experience for me. Congratulations. Um, now, another question that we got, what is your favorite video game and why? Favorite video game? Well, now it's not related to debate at all, but I would have to say either Call of Duty, which is like a standard first-person shooter video game, or League of Legends, which is like, I think it's been the most popular video game for like 11 years, which is kind of ironic because it's the whole time you're playing, you're just getting bullied, but it's like addicting. It's really unhealthy, but I love it. How okay. come? Right, right. Uh, sounds like debate at times, honestly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Made fun of all the time quests. That's not what I was referring to. <laughs> I was talking about the unhealthy part. Uh, but, okay. So, you know, there's been a lot of controversy in the debate community recently. The Harvard Invitational wrapped up, and there's been a lot of discussion oh. about equity and group chats and that type of thing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I would say if there was, like, a way to get everyone in a group chat, I would absolutely be in favor of them. Like, if there's a way to get every single person that signed up for a tournament into some chat room to have everyone discuss bills or discuss anything really, I think that's a really good idea that I'm in favor of. Like even if tournaments would just like provide like a Slack link, which I think tournaments use for like tournament directors or even like Discord, which is the kids version of Slack. I think that would be really helpful because then all of the students can talk to each other. It's basically a group chat, except no one's getting excluded. As much as group chats make debate easier, I don't really like the part where inevitably someone isn't getting added to it and they're essentially being excluded from docket making from, if they want a PO, it's a lot harder if they're not in the, in the uh, group chat. It's just a big disadvantage not having a Facebook account, which realistically having a Facebook account, I don't think should be a requirement to do this event. Yeah, I agree. I think that is really important. Uh, you know, and obviously we don't have answers today and, you know, on how exactly we're going to handle this moving forward. But I think it's definitely a discussion that everybody should be talking about. And I'm sure we'll definitely be talking about it with plenty of students this summer at Ascend. Yeah. So, with that being said, summer at Ascend, registration is open. We are in regular registration now. You can sign up for $900, which puts us at a lower rate than most of our competitors. You get guaranteed one-on-one -on -one sessions and a flexible schedule that is built completely based on your availability. That is for students and coaches alike. We're thinking it's gonna be our even better than last summer and last summer was great. So everybody out there, please, 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 if you haven't already, join Ascend Summer Program, Summer 2021. You can go to our website, ascendspeech.org, which should be linked out um, uh, at the bottom of this video. Anyways, thank you all. Thank you, Joseph, for being a part of this, and I look forward yeah, to- Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure.